2023 elections may make or break Nigeria, Obasanjo warns politicians. Tonight, we continue our conversation on civic education ahead of the 2023 elections. And the court okays OB supporters rally in Lagos, saying participants can't converge on Lekki Toll Gate. This is Plus Politics. I'm Mary Annika. Former President of Nigeria, Chief Olusegun Obasanjo, has warned that the 2023 general elections may make or break the country. Obasanjo, in a statement signed by his special assistant on media, Kainde Akiemi, warned that politicians are capable of wrecking havoc and could make or break the country if leaders fail to watch it. Well, joining us live to discuss this is Shegun Shopiton, he's a public affairs analyst and is also of ACT Network. And Austin Aigbe is a senior programs officer, Center for Democracy and Development, West Africa. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to start with you, Mr. Aigbe. This is not the first time that we've heard um, a politician or a political leader say, oh, this election will be... Uh, the one that, you know, this will be the watershed moment. We had that same experience in 2015. And here we are in 2023. It seems like the same, um, you know, story is being told to us. But then I'm, I, I, I might be wrong again in my assertion. So I'd ask, what exactly, um, you know, uh, is the defining moment for 2023 and why must all hands be on deck? So thank you and thank you for having me. You're right with those assertions. You're very, very right, man. In 2015, if I had in 2011, it was like that was the election that would make a man in Nigeria. In 2015, the same thing came up. In 2019, the same thing. Um, and in 2023, uh, yet again, is coming up. So election, it's something, it, it, it's a convergence that brings all manner of thought, including uh, the possibility of violence. You know how uh, post-election violence in 2011 almost uh, destabilize the whole region of Nigeria. So let me let me try to uh, bring it to the focus. Recently at the Center for Democracy and Development, we had released a report um, which we call the SWOT analysis of the election. So we, we are uh, interrogated a number of things which included insecurity in Nigeria. Um, in 2015 elections, we knew, uh, we rem you remember that in the Northeast, in some of those local government areas, were occupied by its urgency, and there was need to clear those areas. And uh, the election was postponed for about six weeks. And eventually, the military returned, and all of those areas were cleared. Election then took place. In 2019, we had almost the same challenge of military intervention, I mean, insecurity in the political landscape of Nigeria. In 2023, what makes 2023 so unique is arguably that Nigeria is, uh, is facing. Um, an, a, a pandemic of insecurity. Uh, there's literally in every state of Nigeria uh, the, the, some form of uh, insecure narrative, whether it's in Ekiti or Bayesa or Northwest, not East, or even the Southeast, across the, the, the territorial boundaries of Nigeria, there's really no state that you can take out that this is free. Or, I know that some part of um, Southwest may be, may, may be free, but so there are certain areas in the South that is a bit freer than other areas in the north. So the kind of dynamics, with the level of kidnapping, with the level of um, banditry, with the level of bandit attack, is becoming a challenge that the whole nation to conduct an election in a third country will be a challenge. And INEC has also raised this, this as a matter of fact. What is very important, too, is also to bring in a new narrative, uh, talking about the, you, you just talked about, just now, that the court has okayed the, the gathering of um, a, a political party of, of, of folks. So there's a there's a new movement. There's a new a, a new wave of support for a political party, particularly coming from young people. Um, looking at what happened in 2020, the anti protests and all the agitation that happened, there is that fear. And President Basenjo, former President Basenjo, is raising those that for us to have a free to, for us to have a Nigerian state beyond 2023, that should be free, fair, and credible election. An election 
that INEC intend to conduct. Again, the Electoral Commission seems to be very ready because they will be able to do their work by telling us that certain things are going to be happening. This is the processes. This are all of these. So if citizens therefore know what to do, there's a possibility that violence in the election will be reduced. And I tell you, when there was a misconception, misinformation recently about the use of um, electronic transmission, and a lot of people went on Twitter, um, no, you, why are you going to cancel online, online uh, I mean, uh, electronic transmission results? The Electoral Act is clear. And we must be conscious, going into 2023 election, it is going to be a war on electoral disinformation, mm. what is generally called fake news. Fake news will destabilize Nigeria, and we are getting worse. The country is getting worse in terms of the peddling of fake news. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we need to focus on. When we deal with it, we'll have a free, fair election, and Nigeria, election will not matter Nigeria. It will be greater for us as a country. Um, Shagun, I, I want to pick it up from where he stopped. Recently, there was a photo that was being, um, that was making the rounds on social media, even on WhatsApp, about, you know, a CNN a postcard, um, not necessarily a postcard, but a flyer with presidential candidates. And, we, and there was one that was photoshopped without the face of the presidential candidate of the APC, uh, replaced with the face of uh, his deputy, um, as opposed to the original one. Now, for many people um, who necessarily do not support the APC, this was a good thing because they thought that the international media was on their side. But, but I'm, I'm, I'm going somewhere with this. This is some, you know, an example of what we're talking about. And many people retweeted, many people posted it on their social media. Now, for those of us who are in traditional media, who know, you know, uh, the art behind investigation and ma making sure that you have the right information put out there, we had to go get both photos, put, put both of them out there and say, well, this is real and this is fake. Uh, unknown to the media house, of course, that this was what was happening in the country. Um, Many people are now on social media. Most of the movements are on social media. How can civil society also hop on social media, not just leaving the job to just, you know, the conventional media? Uh, and maybe, you know, those who are charged uh, with the responsibility of disinfo uh, dealing with disinformation or misinformation. Civil society does have a role to play. How do you come in here? I mean, um, thanks, Marianne. Look, the... The question you have, of course, civil society will play a role. Um, um, in terms of uh, just trying to uh, perhaps provide some sort of moderating voice um, in all of the conversations that are happening um, in the lead up to the. Oh, Shago, I think that we're lost, losing you. Um, we're, we're having some uh, connection issues with you. I do not know how we're going to deal with that. Shagun, can you hear me? Shagun, can you hear me? I'm going at each other. Okay. Oh, okay. Let yes. me see. Let me. We yeah, I can hear you. I, I think I yes. think there's a network problem. Let me we try and resolve the network problem, and then uh, so maybe you just go on with this. Yes, I will go back to Aibe. Let me try and resolve now. the network problem. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Aibe, so I'd like for you to take on that because um, I've seen many okay. times where these false information. Keeps, it moves at the speed of light. And, you know, hopping on it is the media, yes, were many, but then social, um, civil society does have a role to play. And just as I asked Shegun, how can you capitalize on also the fact that we all are on social media to, you know, spread the message that is right or the proper? So the Center for Democracy and Development does run a fact checking hall. Uh, one of the key strategies is to try to build a number of, uh, to build a community of practice of fact checkers including the media, civil society, uh, citizens, having the, 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 the digital literacy to know what to share. Before you share, how do you confirm it? Um, every citizen needs to be fact checkers. We need to acquire a certain level of digital literacy that not everything that look like, that, that shines like gold is gold. I mean, not everything that shines is gold. I mean, the, the, the dramatic expression. So what is important, going to 2023 election, people need to know that fake news will destabilize. In fact, I use this, this narrative somewhere. I'm going to put it now that if fake news can burn down Nigeria. Beyond what you just talked about just now, about the Photoshop, with a simple digital tool like um, 
Google reverse image search, you can easily discontinue that picture. Mm. But most people, because of the political sensitivity, because of their biases, because of their orientation, what we call confirmation bias, once you don't like the candidate, you are, you are tempted. In fact, you're not even tempted. You love it to share it. Not everything, because at some point, it is going to target your own candidate. And the way it is, is to say any pictures or, 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 or messages you receive on, on social media, particularly on WhatsApp, the E to E, the end to end description, encryption, we, you need to ask the person who sent it to you, excuse me, where's, where's the source of this? Mm. It is a CNN, like that one that was trending. See, CNN is public, it's so global. Go on CNN and search and be sure that it's correct. And if it is fake, go back to the person who shared it and say, why are you sharing fake news? What's your problem? Advise the fellow. You are actually demarketing your candidate mm. when you try always to to peddle fake news against your opponent. And I say this again, and I said it in 2015 elections when we began to see all of the disinformation that trending us on even the mainstream media, um, whether the Lamb Building or the, 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 the uh, Wicked Buhari or whatever, in 2015, ahead of 2015 election, I, I said to a couple of uh, uh, um, uh, um, candidates and all of them, I said, the energy you spend on trying to pull out fake news or disinformation against your opponent is more than enough energy to populate and project your candidate. Mm. What I see young people are doing now, they try as much as possible to demarket opponents. Even political parties hire them. In the Kogi 2019, we saw a narrative where political parties were out hiring youth and creating what they call the data boys. Data boys are folks who stay in one room to create content. They create content against their opponent. Hmm. And what did, what did we do? We have our own mechanism. Every fake news, um, no, in, in the narrative, we usually don't use fake news, but for the sake of this conversation, uh, for ease of, of communication, fake news. The world will be disinformation or misinformation. Every time we spot disinformation, immediately we engage with it, fact check it and release the fact check immediately. Before you knew what was happening, we were reducing the popularity of the so-called data boys and shepherd boys in Bayesa. What do we do? What do we need to do in this election going forward in 2023? Plus TV Africa, all of the mainstream media, we need to acquire this key and build a community of practice where we spot fake news. Mm. Because we now know that fake news will be a destabilizing factor in the 2023 election we can all work together for, to put the right news on. We can build up a synergy between CDD, TV, um, plus Africa, plus TV, uh, plus TV Africa, and a couple of others to, to always populate the right one. In Oshu, in, in Ondo election of 2020, right at the polling unit where the governor voted, the current governor was then, was Ikeben at that time, there was a, a channel's video that popped up on WhatsApp that the governor had been attacked in his own polling unit that his wife had been injured and they'd be risked away. Coincidentally, we were in the same polling unit. Immediately, we had to rush out to channels to say, please, they are using your videos to, to disinform Russian people, and of course, Nigerians and the global community. Channels needed to quickly run on live, run live, and quickly put um, a tag on the same video to say, this is not Russian state. This is not a war. That video came from Delta State, one of the political party primaries, where there was a lot of conflict and there was um, some violence uh, happenings in that party primaries, and eventually ballot boxes and all were destroyed. People mm. bought it. They loved it because elections, elections is a moment where things are very fast. So to answer your question correctly is that we all need to be fact checkers. Don't share information if you don't have the correct fact, if you don't have the correct um, uh, um, source of it. Because yeah. you could be helping to burn the country and you don't want to be part of it. Absolutely. Let's talk about propaganda as a tool in the hands of politicians. You know that um, each political party has, um, one way or the other, um, gotten the services of a spokesperson, a mouthpiece, image makers, people who are going to be speaking on their behalf. And half the time, these people are propagandists. Um, we all were bore witness to the, the drama between Femi Fani Kayade of the All Progressive Congress 
and of course, Senator Dino Malai, and we saw the drama that happened on social media again. So it makes me wonder, um, it's not enough for politicians to sign peace pacts or peace accords. It, I mean, I don't think that's enough, right? But then what about the role that these politicians have to play in making sure that their political parties are also not playing a role in the spread of propaganda. Even though some would say that um, someone would be at a school of thought that this would benefit them one way or the other. Um, Shagwa, I think that you would like to take that. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, apologies for the disruption. So, um, look, this question you ask is pretty much right at the core of the challenge and the, and, and the situation that we find ourselves as, as a country. And um, if you do a simple cause and effect analysis, you know, because sometimes when I look at these types of issues, it's always good to go to the core of what's, behind, what's driving the issue, right? So all of the things that my colleague has just said now, you know, fantastic. And it's, it's something that we all must um, take, stand up, you know, uh, take the responsibility to fight in. The issue of fake news and now talking about propaganda, um, propaganda is a is a tool anywhere in the world for driving the public narrative, you know, and you can drive it in a positive way, you can drive it in a negative sense. But unfortunately, in Nigeria, our politicians, um, you know, the, the, the defining line between propaganda and outright lies is very, very thin. And a lot of times what you find is that what you might be referring to as propaganda is in fact fake news. Mm -hmm. um, is developing narratives that are completely untrue. Uh, we saw it at play in the lead up to the 2014 elections. Uh, we're seeing it at play now, you know, between the major candidates, the supporters for now of the major candidates, when the campaigns kick off as they have now, and as it begins to gather momentum, of course, we're going to see a lot more of, of all of this um, information flying around that you have to consistently try to fact check and debunk. The challenge for me, and I think to solve this problem, um, we have to take a step backwards and ask why it's happening. And you know, Marianne, we've, we've, we've been having this conversation for years. Yes. Um, funny, like it's been years now. And the truth of the matter is that um, the incentives for this police, why are they doing these things? It's a do or die affair for them to get into office. They are pursuing these political offices, whether you're talking about the presidency, whether it's the governorship, you know, at the various states, or even the National Assembly positions, the reward um, available to them for winning or capturing those offices um, is, is tremendous. Mm. And the rewards are such that uh, people would spare no effort, including taking of lives, to get into those places, which means we need to take a step backwards mm. and find how we can rejig the entire political system to ensure that it's more of a service-driven thing rather than um, a place where people can go and enrich themselves, line their pockets, um, and take care of their generations unborn, you know, with the public resources. And how do we do this? Um, at the end of the day, or, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, it still comes back to this question of the ballot, which means Nigerians will need at some point to decide whether they are tired of the status quo or not and make informed choices that will lead us out of this terrible catch-22 situation that we have found ourselves in and that we've been running I'm, around I'm, in I'm curious, and I'm sorry, to, I'm sorry to talk so over long. you, but I'm curious. Um, what, when will Nigerians realize? Because I think that's where, where I'm stuck. Yeah. Uh, because if, it, we, it, if it, we realize that people are willing to kill for an office that they say they want to come in and serve us, and we're still banding behind these people, then maybe the point of realization is a bit more of a mirage uh, as opposed to Absolutely. us coming to realization. So, so, so I, I, don't, I don't think it's a mirage, and I think it's going to happen. And when President Obasan just says, you know, this might be a make or break election for us, 2023, I think this is actually what is kind of alluding to. Because I think that what's, what's happened in the last um, 23 years, but especially in the last seven years, is that Nigerians have come to sort of realize, and if you have a conversation with pretty much almost everybody, I think there is a bit of a consensus as to the fact that um, neither of the two major political parties have the answer. 
I think there's a bit of a consensus on that. Of course, everybody will not agree on that, but I think it's beginning to become clearer that um, um, the political players, actors themselves, who are scattered across all of these parties are the problem, right? So first, so that's a first step, you know, before you'd find that, oh, people are rooting for APC, and then all of a sudden it's all about the PDP. In some states, it's, you know, one party or the other. But I think we're getting to a point now where Nigerians are beginning to say, hey, wait a minute, these guys are the same. So that's the first step. Now, the next step in this quest and in this journey, we hope that it may happen in 2023, but in case it doesn't, it will happen eventually. We'll get to a point where Nigerians will then realize that we need to elect leaders and maybe one dare says a leader that can start the process of healing the country and, and more or less delivering us from this, this political system that has been deliberately rigged to keep Nigeria and Nigerians in in this in this um, vicious cycle of non-development, you know, until we get to that point, I'm afraid, you know, propaganda will be there, um, you know, rigging of elections, even as you know, with all the fantastic and lofty ideas that INEC has come up with for, you know, with the uh, uh, bimodal verification system. Hey, see what's happening. They're still looking for ways to to to, <laughs> to compromise this thing. So until we get to a point where we can fix our leadership, we must understand that these things these things are going to continue. And, um, um, uh, um, you know, we'll get there one day. I don't know whether it's 2023, but, you know, I believe, I'm a hopeful person, so I, I believe that we'll get there one day. Let me come back to you, Aiwe. Still talk on the lines of realisation. Uh, we've seen that there have been more and more divisions across the country along the lines of religion, along the lines of um, ethnicity. Um, and we've seen more and more. The lines are getting wider and wider. And in the midst of all these divisions stands a political leader from one political ethnic group or from one political party, I beg your pardon, or the other, representing ethnic interests. And half the time, um, most of the people who seem to be at the, their followers are looking at these issues as, as opposed to looking at it based on how it affects us as Nigerians. We see them looking at it through these same prisms of religion and ethnicity. Now we're hearing dissenting voices. The North is saying this. The Middle Belt is saying this. Um, why can't we say Nigerians are saying this? Aibe, can these lines ever be blurred, especially as we get ready for 2023 elections? Or is it going to be business as usual? So you see what is happening in Nigeria is some, to some degree, there's, there's some kind of reawakening of a consciousness that Nigeria belongs to all of us. There's some form of reawakening that the Nigerian state, if we don't protect it, if we don't choose our own leaders, we are going into a state of, I mean, a state of irrelevance as a country. Nigeria is the largest black nation, whether it's in Africa, across the globe, whatever statistics you have, but the peoples of Nigeria deliberately, by way of political manipulation, are kept under the poverty line. A poor person is likely to do anything for 500 naira or 1,000 naira. What the politicians have done is to keep people within a threshold that at some point you use them for your own will. When you use the word just now as propaganda, and I, I like the comment made by my colleague, most propaganda for political part parties or candidates are not propaganda. They are disinformation aimed to manipulate mm. the psyche and the mindset of the citizenry. Does poverty have ethnicity? Does insecurity have ethnicity? Does poverty have religion? Does insecurity have... Unfortunately, we have uh, lost that connection. I, I, we, finally, because we're almost out of time, uh, Shagun, finally, what should we be... Yes, okay, quickly, quickly, Aigwe, because we're running out of time, quickly. Okay, does stri strike action have religion? No. It is time now that we need to converge as Nigeria, that you need a leader that's a Nigerian and not a sessional leader, a Nigerian leader. And that happened, I mean, there's a lot of stories to talk about, but because of time, I'll just stop at this point, because Nigerians need to know 
that you need a Nigerian leader that knows how to deal with poverty, know how to deal with insecurity, know how to deal with education, health, agriculture, and all of the things that make good life for all of us. Mm. Finally, uh, Shegun, what should be the messaging from now till uh, election day, in closing? I think for me, in closing, right, mm, um, if you look at what uh, President Obasanjo is saying, I think, I, I think that's what we need to actually let Nigerians uh, digest and perhaps uh, begin to think about. We may, if we're not careful, right, we may be in the last few years of this entity as we know it, if we're not careful. Um, and I say that because if you look at the trajectory that the country has traveled in the last 23 years, you find that it's been a consistent downward spiral, right? And it's all driven and on, uh, on the back of poor governance. It's as simple as that. Poor economic policies, poor, you know, whatever. Just look at all the good governance indicators. We're simply failing at it because the political system is not designed to deliver good governance. And it will not continue in, in, in indefinitely. Eventually, we will get to, to the Rubicon and the country will fall over the cliff if we continue downwards. So I think Nigerians need to understand that we are basically in an existential situation. We need to save ourselves from these guys by electing a leader or leaders that are genuinely interested in delivering development. It's not an easy question to answer, but I think that's the question that we need to answer. The person you cast your vote for, does he intend by track record to serve you or himself and his people? I'll just leave it there. I think a question that all Nigerians have to answer is this one. Well, I want to say thank you. Shago Shopito is a public affairs analyst and he's also of ACT Network. And um, Austin Aigwe is the senior program officer, Center for Democracy and Development West Africa. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for this conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, we'll take a quick break. When we return, we'll be discussing the Labour Party March here in Lagos on Saturday. We have one of the conveners here with us in the studio. Stay with us.